Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi, student nurses. I'm Crystal Merdukanes, clinical instructor teaching fundamentals of nursing practice. Today, we will be talking about Safety Safety is a fundamental concern of nurses, which extends from the bedside to the home to the community, is preventing injuries and assisting the injured. Motor vehicle crashes, falls, drowning, fire and burns, poisoning, inhalation and ingestion of foreign objects, and firearm use are major causes of injury and death. Nurses need to be aware of what constitutes a safe environment for a particular person or for a group of people in home and community settings. Injuries are often caused by human conduct and can be prevented. Here we have factors affecting safety. The ability of people to protect themselves from injury is affected by such factors as age and development. Through knowledge and accurate assessment of the environment, people learn to protect themselves from many injuries. Children walking to school learn to stop before crossing the street and wait for oncoming traffic. They also learn not to touch a hot stove for the very young Learning about the environment is essential. Only through knowledge and experience do children learn what is potentially harmful. Older adults, however, can, be difficult, can have difficulty with movement and diminished sensory neurologic acuity, which can contribute to the likelihood of injury. Next, we have lifestyle. Lifestyle factors that place people at risk for injury include unsafe work environments, residents in neighborhoods with high crime rates, access to firearms, insufficient income to purchase safety equipment or make necessary repairs, and access to illicit drugs which may also be contaminated by harmful addictives. Another one is mobility and health status. Alterations in mobility related to paralysis, muscle weakness, diminished balance, and lack of coordination place clients at risk for injury. We also have sensory perceptual alterations. Acute sensory perception of environmental stimuli is vital to safety. People with impaired touch perception, hearing, Taste, smell, and vision are highly susceptible to injury. Next, we have cognitive awareness. Awareness is the ability to perceive environmental stimuli and body reactions and to respond appropriately through thought and action. Clients with impaired awareness include people lacking sleep, people who are unconscious and semi-conscious, disoriented people who may not understand where they are or what to do to help themselves, people who perceive stimuli that do not exist, and people whose judgment is altered by disease or medications such as narcotics, tranquilizers, hypnotics, and sedatives. Another one is emotional state. Extreme emotional states can alter the ability to perceive environmental hazards. Stressful situations can reduce a person's level of concentration, cause errors of judgment, and decrease awareness of external stimuli. People with depression may think and react to environmental stimuli more slowly than usual. Next is the ability to communicate. Individuals with diminished ability to receive and convey information 
are at risk for injury. They include clients with aphasia, language barriers, or the ability to read. For example, the person unable to interpret the sign no smoking, oxygen in use, could cause a fire. Another one is safety awareness. Information is crucial to safety. Clients in unfamiliar environments frequently need specific safety information. Lack of knowledge about unfamiliar equipment such as oxygen tanks, intravenous tubings, and hot packs is a potential hazard. Lastly, we have environmental factors. Client safety is affected by the healthcare setting. Depending on the client situation, the nurse may need to assess the environment of the home, workplace, or community. So for the environmental factors, it is necessary for the nurse to assess the environment in healthcare settings, in the workplace, home, and community. We also have national safety concerns, which include bioterrorism and natural disasters. Bioterrorism attack. It is a deliberate release of viruses, bacteria, or other germs or agents used to cause illness or death in people animals, or plants. Bioterrorism agents are separated into three categories, depending on how easily they can be spread and the severity of illness or death they cause. So we have Category A agents, Category B agents, and lastly, we have Category C agents. For Category A agents, it is regarded as the highest risk among the three categories. It can be easily spread or transmitted from person to person. Result in high death rates and have the potential for major public health impact. And it might cause public panic and social disruption. And lastly, it requires special action for public health preparedness. Example for this are your anthrax and smallpox. Next, we have Category B agents. It is considered as the second highest priority. And it is moderately easy to spread, result in moderate illness rates and low death rates requires specific enhancements of CDC's laboratory capacity and enhanced disease monitoring. Example of this is Salmonella. Lastly, we have Category C agents. It includes emerging pathogens that could be engineered for mass spread in the future because they are easily available, are easily produced and spread, and they have the potential for high morbidity and mortality rates and major health impact. Example of this is your influenza and human immunodeficiency virus or your HIV. Now let's proceed to disaster planning. Nursing personnel play a key role in disaster management and client care throughout all aspects of the healthcare industry. Nurses are employed in acute care facilities, ambulatory care facilities, long-term care facilities, and within community agencies, including home care and public health. Now let's proceed to the nursing diagnosis Related to safety, we have risk for injury, such as falls, latex allergy response infection, suffocation, poisoning, trauma, vascular trauma, aspiration, etc. We also have deficient knowledge. 
on accident prevention, and also readiness for enhanced knowledge on accident prevention. Now let's proceed to the risk factors of suicide for older adults. The incidence of suicide in older adults is increasing. As people age, they experience both physical and emotional losses. They often develop chronic illnesses which can lead to functional loss and disability, and their memory and other cognitive functions often decline. All of these losses make the older adult more susceptible to depression, which is a major risk factor for suicide. So here are the key risk factors for suicide in older adults. First, we have gender. The suicide rate for men 75 years and older is almost twice the rate for men of all ages. Second, rural communities. Suicide rates are three times higher in rural areas than in urban areas. Next, we have depression. Common symptoms of depression such as fatigue, sleep problems, and weight loss or gain may incorrectly be attributed to the older person's existing chronic illnesses. Chronic pain can also worsen depression. Lastly, we have social isolation. The risk of suicide increases when social isolation is due to bereavement or loss of social support. Compared with the general population, suicide attempts by older individuals are usually more serious because of a greater degree of premeditation and planning to end the life, not just to get attention as it's as is often seen in other age groups. Now let's proceed to preventing specific hazard or injuries. Implementing measures to specific or to prevent specific hazards or injuries such as falls, seizures, skulls and burns, fires, carbon monoxide poisoning, suffocation or choking, excessive noise, electrical hazards, firearms, radiation, and bioterrorism attacks are critical aspects of nursing care. Teaching clients about safety is an important aspect that nurses should implement. Nurses usually have opportunities to teach while providing care. Now let's have falls. It is the leading cause of injuries among older adults. And it can break bones and self-confidence leading to fear of falling which can cause a decreased activity level and decreased muscle strength. We also have risk factors for falls. First, we have poor vision, cognitive dysfunction such as confusion, disorientation, impaired memory or judgment. We also have impaired gait or balance and difficulty walking because of lower extremity dysfunction such as arthritis. Next, we have difficulty getting in and out of a chair or bed. Fifth, we have orthostatic hypotension. Sixth, urinary frequency or receiving diuretics. Seventh, we have weakness from disease process or therapy. And lastly, we have current medication regimen that includes sedation, hypnotics, tranquilizers, narcotic analgesics, and diuretics. Here are the universal fall precautions. First, we have to familiarize the uh, we have to make sure that the client is familiar with the environment. Have the client teach back how to use the call light. 
Keep the call light within reach at all times. Keep the client's personal possessions within safe reach. Provide sturdy handrails in client's bathrooms, rooms, and hallway. We also keep the hospital bed in low position with brakes locked when client is resting in bed. Provide non-slip, well-fitting footwear. Use night lights or supplemental light. Keep floor surfaces clean and dry. Clean up all spills promptly. Keep client area uncluttered. Now let's have the electronic safety monitoring devices. It detects when clients are attempting to move or get out of the bed. For example, a bed or chair safety monitor has a position-sensitive switch that triggers an audio alarm when the client attempts to get out of the bed or chair. Remember that when the client falls, the nurse's first duty is to the client. First, you need to assess for injuries. Then after assessing the injuries, you have to notify or inform the primary care provider or the doctor. Next, let's proceed to seizures. What is a seizure? It is a temporary event that consists of uncontrolled electrical neural discharge of the brain that interrupts normal function. And it is classified into two categories. We have the partial seizure and the generalized seizure. For your partial seizure, it is also known as focal, which involves electrical discharges from one area of the brain. And for the generalized seizure, it affects the whole brain. Each of these seizure categories includes different type of seizures depending on the characteristics of seizure activity like loss of consciousness versus no impairment to consciousness. Thus, it is important for nurses to thoroughly describe their observations before during and after a client's seizure episode. Clients are at risk for injury if they experience seizures that involve the entire body, such as grand mal or tonic-clonic seizures or any seizure that include loss of consciousness. Now let's proceed to seizure precautions. These are safety measures taken by the nurse to protect clients from injury should they have seizures. So here is the first aid for seizures. For convulsions, generalized tonic, clonic, and grand mal. Cushion head, remove glasses. Loosen tight clothing and turn the patients to sides. Time the seizure with a watch. Don't put anything in mouth. Look for identification or IDs. Don't hold down. As seizure ends, offer help. So these are the measures uh, for your seizures. Now let's implement seizures precaution. First, if the client has frequent or recurrent seizures or take anticonvulsant medications, they should wear a medical identification tag and carry a card delineating any meds they take. When making home visits, inspect anti-epileptic medications and confirm that the clients are taking them correctly. Blood level measures may be required periodically. Assist clients in determining who in the community should or must be informed of their seizure disorders. Discuss safety precautions from 
for inside and outside of the home and discuss with the client and family factors that may precipitate a seizure. Now let's proceed to scalds and burns. When we say scald, it is a burn from hot liquid or vapor such as steam. We also have burn. It results from excessive exposure to thermal, chemical, electrical, or radioactive agents. Here are the common home hazards causing scalds. Pot handles that protrude over the edge of a stove, electric appliances used to heat liquids or oil, and excessively hot bath water. In healthcare agencies, the risk of scalds and burns is greater for clients whose skin sensitivity to temperature is impaired. Scalds can occur from overly hot bath water and burns can occur from therapeutic applications of heat. It is important for the nurse to assess how well clients can protect themselves and what special precautions, if any, need to be taken. Now let's proceed to fires. It continues to be a constant risk in both healthcare settings and homes. We have agency fires. It, is usually, it usually results from malfunctioning electrical equipment or combustion of anesthetic gas. Also, we have home fires. It mostly frequently results from careless disposal of burning cigarettes or matches from grease or from faulty electrical wiring. What to do in case of fire? In healthcare agencies, fire is particularly hazardous when people are incapacitated and unable to leave the building without assistance. This incapacity makes it extremely important for nurses to be aware of the fire safety regulations and fire prevention practices of the agencies in which they work. When smoke or fire is detected, two mnemonics can help the nurse remember the steps to follow. First is the RACE protocol, that's the rescue, alarm, contain, and extinguish. Your RACE protocol for the R, it's rescue. If the area is safe to enter, protect and evacuate clients who are in immediate danger. A for alarm, pull the fire alarm and report the fire details and location to the hospital's fire emergency extension. C for confine, contain the fire by closing the doors to all rooms and the fire doors at each entrance to the unit. Then E for extinguish. Extinguish the fire. Use the appropriate type of fire extinguisher or evacuate the area if the fire is too large for, fire ex for a fire extinguisher. There are three categories of fire according to type of materials. For class A, we have paper, wood, upholstery, rags, and ordinary rubbish. For class B, we have flammable liquids and gases. For class C, we have electrical equipment, wiring, appliances, computers, and circuit breakers. Now, let's have the procedures on how to use the fire extinguisher. So remember the mnemonic PASS. The right type of extinguisher must be used to fight the fire. Extinguishers have picture symbols showing the type of fire for which they are to be used. Directions for use are also attached. The nurse follows the mnemonics pass when using a fire extinguisher. P stands for pull out the extinguisher's safety pins. A stands for aim. 
aim the, ho the hose at the base of the fire. S stands for squeeze or press the handle to discharge the material onto the fire. And lastly, we have sweep the, ho the hose from side to side across the base of the fire until the fire appears to be out. Now let's proceed to home fires. Nursing intervention, interventions for home fires focus on teaching fire safety. Preventive measures include the following. Keep emergency numbers near the telephone or stored for speed dialing. Be sure the smoke alarms are operable and appropriately located. Teach the client to change the batteries in their smoke alarms annually on a special day such as a birthday or January 1. Have a family fire, fire drill plan. Keep fire extinguishers available and in working order. Close windows and doors if possible. Cover the mouth and nose with a damp cloth when exiting through a smoke-filled area and avoid heavy smoke by assuming a bent position with the head as close as the floor as possible. Now let's proceed to carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide, it is an odorless, colorless, tasteless gas that is very toxic. Symptoms are headache, dizziness, weakness, nausea, vomiting, or loss of muscle control. Prolonged exposure to carbon monoxide can lead to unconsciousness, brain damage, or death. Now let's proceed to poisoning. For children, inadequate supervision and improper storage of many household toxic substances are the major reasons. Next, we have adolescents and adult poisonings. These are usually caused by insect or snail bites and drugs used for recreation or in suicide attempts. Implementing poison prevention in these age groups focuses on providing information and counseling. Next, we have poisoning in older adults usually results from accidental ingestion of a toxic substance due to failing eyesight or an overdose of a prescribed medication due to impaired memory. Implementing poison prevention with older adults focuses on safeguarding the environment and monitoring the underlying problems. In older adults who have dementia, poisoning is often a safety problem. A cognitive abilities deteriorate the same precautions need to be taken as with the children, which is implementing poison prevention is focused on teaching parents to childproof the environment including disposing the unused medications properly. Nurses intervene in community settings by educating the public about what to do in the event of poisoning, such as identify the specific poison by search for an open container, empty bottle, or other evidence. Contact the poison control center, indicate the exact quantity of poison the person ingested, and state the person's age and apparent symptoms. Now let's proceed to suffocation or choking. It is also known as asphyxiation. Lack of oxygen due to interrupted breathing. And one of the common reasons for choking is that food or a foreign object has become lodged in the throat. The universal sign of distress is the victim's grasping the anterior neck and being unable to speak or cough. The emergency response for this is your hemlich maneuver, also known as your abdominal thrust, 
which can dislodge the foreign objects and re-establish an airway. So we have here the Himlik maneuver. So you have to position thumb side of fist one inch above navel and well below tip of sternum. Thrust fist inward and upward. Stop occasionally to check victim and your technique. The motion of the Himlik maneuver raises the diaphragm causing the lungs to compress. This compression forces air out of the lungs and at a high enough pressure to expel the object. In infants, you have to place them stomach down across your forearm and give five quick forceful blows on the infant's back with heel of your hand. In children, you have to place one fist just above the child's navel with a thumb side facing the abdomen. For the other causes of suffocation, we have drowning, gas, smoke inhalation, accidental coverage of nose and mouth by a piece of plastic, Accidental strangulation by the shoulder harness of a seat belt and trapped in a confined space. If a person does not receive immediate relief from suffocation, the interrupted breathing leads to respiratory and cardiac arrest and death. Any obstruction to the air passages must be immediately removed and life support measures instituted when an arrest occurs. Now we have your excessive noise, a health hazard that can cause hearing loss depending on the overall level of noise, the frequency range of the noise, and the duration of exposure and individual susceptibility. Noise can be minimized in several ways. Acoustic tiles on ceilings, Walls and floors are well as drape as well as drapes and carpeting absorb sound. Background music can mask noise and have a calming effect on some people. It is important for nurses to minimize noise in the hospital setting and to encourage clients to protect their hearing as much as possible. Next we have your electrical hazards. When major electrical injury, macro shock, does occur, the victim may sustain both superficial and deep burns, muscle contractions, and cardiac and respiratory arrest, necessitating cardiopulmonary resuscitation and life support. We have a term called electric shock. It occurs when a current travels through the body to the ground rather than through electrical wiring or from static electricity that builds up on the body. Using machines in good repair, wearing shoes with, rubbles, with rubber soles, standing on non-conductive floor and using non-conductive gloves can prevent macro shock or electrical injury. However, even with such precautions, the rescuer must know that the victim is not to be touched until the electricity is shut off or the victim has been removed from contact with the electric current. Otherwise, the, re the rescuer may also receive electrical injury. Now let's proceed to firearms. Parents who bring a handgun into the home must accept full responsibility for teaching safety rules to any children who have knowledge of the presence of firearms. The following basic firearm safety rules must be implemented for any gun. Store all guns in, in the sturdy locked cabinets without glass and make sure the keys are inac inaccessible to children. Store the bullets in a different location from the guns. Tell children never to touch a gun or stay in a friend's house where a gun is accessible. Teach children 
never to point the barrel of a gun at anyone. Ensure the firearm is unloaded and the action is open when handling it to, this, to someone else. Don't handle firearms while affected by alcohol or drugs of any kind, including pharmaceuticals. When cleaning or dry firing a firearm, remove all ammunitions to another room and double check the firearm when you enter the room you will be using to clean the firearm. Have firearms that are regularly used inspected by a qualified gunsmith at least two years. Now let's proceed to radiation. It can occur from overexposure to radioactive materials used in diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Exposure can be minimized by Limiting the time near the, the source. Second, providing as much distance as possible from the source. And third, using shielding devices such as lead aprons. Now let's proceed to bioterrorism. No one knows when an attack will occur. So planning and preparation are very important. For the procedure and equipment related accidents, risk assessment in the healthcare setting must, must include risk related to procedures and equipment. Nurses need to follow safeguards to prevent errors or accidents whenever giving a medication or assisting a child out of bed. Most healthcare agencies establish protocols that are designed to prevent accidents. When in doubt about the course of action, the nurse should consult the appropriate written guidelines before proceeding. When an accident or error does occur, most agencies require that the incident be reported. The nurse completes the report immediately after taking whatever action is required to safeguard the client and notifying the charge nurse. Now let's proceed to restraining clients. So what do we mean when we say restraints? So these are devices used to limit the physical activity of a client or a part of the body. So it is classified as two physical restraints, chemical restraints, and the use of seclusion. When we say physical restraints, it includes any material, manual method, physical or mechanical device, material or equipment that immobilizes or reduces the ability of a patient to move his or her arms, legs, body, or head freely. We also have chemical restraints. So it involves using a medication to control behavior or to restrict the client's freedom of movement and is not a standard treatment for the client's medical or psychological condition. Lastly, we have the use of seclusion. The involuntary confinement of a client alone in a room or area from which the client is physically prevented from leaving. Here we have the standards for use of restraints and seclusion. Restraints may be used to ensure the client's immediate physical safety. Even if the client is not violent or self-destructive. Seclusion may only be used for the management of violent or self-destructive behavior that is an immediate threat to the client's physical safety. Third, we have restraints or seclusion may only be used when less restrictive interventions have been determined to be ineffective to protect the client, a staff member, or others from harm. Fourth, the, the type or technique of restraints or seclusion used must be the least restrictive intervention that will be effective to protect the client 
a staff or others from harm. And the use of restraints or seclusion must be implemented in accordance with safe and appropriate restraints and seclusion techniques per hospital policy. And lastly, restraints or seclusion must be discontinued at the earliest possible time. Now let's proceed to the selection of a restraint. So before selecting a restraint, nurses need to understand its purpose clearly and measure it against the following five criteria. First, it restricts the client's movement as little as possible. If a client needs to have one arm restrained, do not restrain the, uh, the entire body. Second, it is safe for the particular client. Choose a restraint with which the client cannot self-inflict injury. For example, a physical restraint from person could incur injury trying to climb out of bed if one wrist is tied to the bed frame. A jacket restraint would restrain the person more safely. Third criteria is it does not interfere with the child's treatment or health problem. If a child has a poor blood circulation to the hands, apply a restraint that will not aggravate the circulatory problem. Fourth, it is readily changeable. Restraints need to be changed frequently, especially if they become soiled. Keeping other guidelines in mind, choose a restraint that can be changed with minimal disturbance to the client. Lastly, it is as discreet as possible. Both clients and visitors are often embarrassed by a restraint, even though they understand why it is being used. The less obvious the restraint, the more comfortable people will feel. So I believe this is the end of my discussion or lecture on the topic safety. So I hope you learned something today. So thank you so much for listening.